on you. Hello. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you on the web. This is Shireen Carrico, and I am here with Lynn Legier. It is 12 o'clock promptly, so we want to make sure that we start on time and we respect your time. We appreciate so much you joining us. We're, we are so excited about this opportunity through SAMHSA to start a statewide peer and consumer organization, and we're glad that you decided to join us. We are recording this, so if there's anybody that cannot be present, we will make sure that it's posted on the Facebook page as well as uh, the PRN page. And also feel free to share it uh, with everybody that cannot be in attendance. So just a few logistics to share with you. Everybody is muted just so we can minimize uh, the background noise. But if you have a question to ask, there is a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. You can uh, click on that, ask a question. You can also raise your hand. Lynn is going to be watching all of the um, links to make sure if there are any questions that you have that we can catch it. Um, and she's going to be my co-facilitator for the day. So thank you all so much. Um, this is really our official launch of the SAMHSA North Carolina Statewide Consumer Network Grant. We are so incredibly excited to be able to do this and have this opportunity here in North Carolina and are excited to see, honestly, what we do with this as a consumer and peer community. Today's presentation is really to give you the overview of what led up to the grants um, from the perspective of SAMHSA, why they contribute this funding to different states. We're going to talk a little bit about why North Carolina was chosen. There are certain ingredients that we have here in North Carolina that made us um, pretty appetizing, if you would, to SAMHSA to be able to invest in. We're going to go through our proposal with some of our structures, our proposed goals and objectives and deliverables. You will see that through a SAMHSA grant, it is very particular in terms of deadlines, timeframes, how it's delivered, and the objectives. So we're going to go through that, and then we're going to end with talking about what's next. How are we going to build allies? How are we going to break this work down to be able to accomplish what we want in the next three years? So that's going to be our, our, um, our, our plan for today. We have about an hour and a half together, and we are going to kick it off with Lynn. I'm going to actually push my computer over so you can see and hear Lynn. Hey, everybody. I'm also, like Shereen, very thrilled to be here and, and excited about this kickoff moment as we begin to uh, figure out sort of what this grant is about, where it came from, uh, and really kick off the beginning of opening the doors for all of us. This isn't a PRM thing. This is a we as a community thing, um, which I'm really excited about. But we really want to um, start by talking about the grant itself where it comes from, its significance, what makes it important. And thank you. Um, so, so the grant itself actually is very closely tied to the history of what has been called the consumer survivor expatient movement or the psychiatric survivors movement. Um, it's had a lot of names over the years. 
Um, but this award comes from those very early days of activism and um, uh, advocacy on the part of people with lived experience. This movement that we're talking about began way back in 1970, uh, at the same time that we had a number of civil rights movements going on. Uh, growing up in that era, I remember it well as the days of protests and we were out on the streets and some of the rights movements uh, of the day were women's rights and um, gay rights and disability rights and of course most notably was civil rights around racial issues. But it was a time of really fighting for rights and people that had been in mental health systems and had um, felt that there was oppression involved in those systems and the way people were treated uh, also began to take to the streets uh, fighting for our civil rights as well. The early movement really had three core um, steps of the stool that it stood on. First was messaging that people actually can get better. Uh, in, the, in, that, in those days, there was only one prognosis for people that had mental health diagnoses, and that was for lifelong chronic debilitating illness. And folks that were experiencing something different who were experiencing a return to a good, meaningful life were out there messaging that uh, diagnosis is not necessarily destiny and that it's really important that people see more than that one picture. It was also very much uh, on the pedestal of activism about treatment conditions and oppression. The idea that once you have a mental health diagnosis, many of your basic civil and human rights are taken away in the way our systems were organized. And so the movement was about activism to change those oppressive uh, conditions within our mental health systems. And then the third and just as important stool step that it relied on was the idea of demands to be at the table, to be at every table, that uh, we bring to those tables uh, incredibly important experience from our own lives that needs to be considered in any kind of policy. And so this movement took the motto of the disabilities movement as a whole and the idea of nothing about us without us. One of the grandmothers. That was one of the core pieces is that we are thinking people, we are functioning people, and we are people of dignity that should be at the tables and influencing uh, the policies. So through the activating, mobilizing, and impacting that they were do were doing in those early days, it went from being something that was in the streets to Judy Chamberlain writing a book called On Our Own, which is a wonderful manual for how do we, as people uh, with lived experience, create services that are helpful and healing alternatives to our uh, current mental health systems. That book became really a manifesto that many of the early um, self-help and uh, advocacy um, agencies was built on, most notably Ruby Rogers, which he started a center in Boston that was the first peer-run alternative support center for people with mental health challenges, named after Ruby Rogers, who fought for her right to um, uh, decline medication, to refuse medication. Uh, that uh, eventually became uh, a national um, uh, policy that people have that right due to the court case that she brought. Judy also started the National Empowerment Center, the first national advocacy uh, organization that went to federal policymakers and said we should be at the table. And out of these 
really important steps that they were taking across a number of fields. Finally, what happened was they did get the, the voice and the ear of the federal government to join in. And that is through the um, creation of the very first Alternatives Conference back in 1985, which was funded by SAMHSA. Um, and SAMHSA is the grant that funded us. So we just wanted to talk about that grant for a little bit, this, uh, about SAMHSA for a little bit. SAMHSA is a federal agency that um, their mission is to improve um, and advance the behavioral health of the nation. They have two divisions, really. They have a substance use division and a mental health division. Um, this grant is of the mental health division. They fund many, many different kinds of uh, programs across the country, some of which are up here. Many more exist beyond this. But back in 18, 1985, SAMHSA came on board and said, we're going to try to help fund this conference for people with lived experience who are out mobilizing together, trying to think of good alternative supports that help people in their own mental health recovery. And um, in just three years later, as part of this um, federal listening was going on, three years later, they put out, SAMHSA put out this very first grant of what we're talking about here, the very first statewide consumer network grant. So we wanted to give you a little of that history so that um, you could understand the context of where this grant comes from, that it's been around since 1988. It goes out every year. We were very grateful that, uh, you know, as administrations change, somehow this grant survives year after year and survived for uh, yet another round that we were lucky enough to uh, apply for. Some of the great successes that have come out of statewide consumer networks that have gotten help from this grant uh, are listed here. And these are just a few of the many. But Georgia, many of us who work as peer supporters are very in touch with the work of the Georgia Statewide Consumer Network. They created that very first CPS training that became Medicaid funded so that we could work in systems and have a funding source. The Pennsylvania Statewide Consumer Network has gone on to create the first Medicaid funded forensic peer support training and service in their state. The Groundhogs up in Massachusetts, where you, many of you know I come from, we work together to um, uh, keep pushing the state to finally agree to do the first uh, state-funded peer respite back oh, almost a decade ago now. Empower of Massachusetts chose a more legislative route, and they created a bill that got passed by the legislature that includes five fundamental rights for all people in state hospitals, including the right for fresh air. The Consumer Council of Maine runs an annual conference. Um, the Tennessee Mental Health Consumers Network has created many programs, but most notably, they're building a recovery of individual dreams and goals through education and support, better known as BRIDGES. This is a program that left Tennessee and went across the country into Canada and Europe. They've also created a peer intensive care service. On our own Maryland, as one of the very first statewide consumer agencies, uh, consumer run agencies, ran that first alternatives conference with SAMHSA funding. They've also created the Main Street Housing Project that provides affordable housing for people and their families, uh, people with mental health challenges. And finally, on this list, but certainly not finally in the breadth of all the work that's been done, is the Vermont Psychiatrics uh, Survivors Association. They've created a role of a patient representative out of their organization, not as a state-funded um, position, but out of that their organization that will go into state hospitals and work with people and advocate for them 
uh, to navigate systems and if their rights are being um, violated to help them get the need to assert their rights and get their rights met. This is, as I say, just a small list of things that people have done with this grant over the many, many years. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited that we're, we're here and we have the opportunity as a community to think about what does North Carolina want to do in the world of 2019. And with that, I turn it back to Shereen. Thank you, Lynn. So yeah, so this is part of the excitement. So North Carolina is the 27th state to receive this grant. This is the first time that we have received it in our state. And so it really is unprecedented and quite a big deal when we look at nationally all of the amazing work that's been done through the statewide consumer and peer organizations. We now have the opportunity to make the mark in our own state and demonstrate how North Carolinians step up with voice and choice. And so you, if you look it up, um, what you're gonna see under SAMHSA is an FOA number, and that's at the top of your screen, SM-19-002. So if you're bored someday and you want to read through the, I don't know, hundreds of pages of the grant that went out, you can actually look it up through that SM-19-002 number, and the actual title was Statewide Consumer Network Grant you're going to see that for the next portion we are taking language specifically from the grant um, because we want you all to know we know it so well because we wrote the grant and we were in it for such a long time but we want to make sure that you all know exactly what the grant uh, said what it was written for and what the intention is of the grant so that we're all having some shared knowledge as we create this movement in north carolina so this is the first quote Statewide consumer networks are best poised to bring peer voice, guidance, and foresight into system change. That was written into the grant, and that is the legacy that Lynn was talking about with SAMHSA, that SAMHSA continues to invest in these statewide peer networks because there is a recognition with the work that's been done that we have a voice that can be very influential to guide system change towards recovery and quality of life. And so it's important for us to come together and work together to share that voice. Now the announcement, the FOA went out on October 24th and had a very steep turnaround time of December 24th. If you think of December 24th, you are correct. That was um, during the holidays, right before the holidays. So I think I was writing and typing and uh, we were making decisions the, uh, pretty close to that deadline about this grant. Um, you'll hear me talk about in a little while the intensity of the process to write the grant, have it submitted, have it approved. Our notification was on March 28th and the grant started on March 31st. So one of the things that you'll find out is that they don't give us a lot of notice and they sent me an email um, on March 29th saying, don't forget, you're starting March 31st. And these are due within the next couple of weeks, exactly. It is a three-year grant. So when you look at that projected dates or the project dates, it started 331.19 and the grant goes through 331.22. The reason why they do that is they consider this what they call a seed grant, which is giving money in multiple years to see what we can do to start a movement. So it's not enough to operate a movement or to operate an agency. The money is intended to start it up and then see what we can demonstrate over the next few years, which could potentially make us eligible for other funding around operation and sustainability. So this is a quote that also came from the grant um, about why it was designed. It was designed to ensure that people with lived experience are catalysts for transforming mental health and related systems. We'll talk about the related systems in a minute. Um, in their state, so this is a state by state grant. The intention is to strengthen the coalitions among existing community organizations and between people with lived experience, policymakers, service providers, to recognize that people with lived experience are effective change agents. So you're gonna see throughout this process, there will be a lot of effort on coalition building, on uniting for a message and finding some shared values and some shared platforms across people with lived experience and with policymakers, providers, allies, 
and advocacy groups and individual advocates. Absolutely. They have definitely kept some of the values and, and those initial pillars alive and well today, which is really great to see that it, it's been very consistent in terms of the message. Some of the wording has changed, but the message has been pretty consistent. So the purpose of this grant is to assist primarily people with labels of serious mental illness, as well as co-occurring disorders, particular co-occurring substance disorders, to work with these other groups and build access of quality mental health services for adults. It's important to recognize that because as Lynn said, there are several different divisions of SAMHSA and on the behavioral health side, what they coined the behavioral health side, there's a mental health portion, there's a substance use portion. On the mental health side is where this grant originated from. There is some on the substance use side, but they really wanna make sure that for this grant, it is focusing on the needs of people that have been labeled with serious mental illness and co-occurring substance disorders. So I see a hand up from Cindy. So I'm gonna try my hand at some text, Cindy, to see if I can make this work, okay? All right. Okay, Cindy. Cindy, are you there? Yeah, so please put in the Q&A box on the bottom what your question or your comment is, and then Lynn will take a look yeah, at it and respond. Minute. Thank you. For some reason, it's not letting us unmute, yes. so I apologize for that tech glitch. So here's another interesting thing about the grant. There are two different sections of the grant um, purposes that I want to make sure that you're aware of. One uh, includes required activities of the grant. That means that there are several things that we absolutely have to do as a part of this grant because it's being funded. The other section is called optional or alternative things that, that we can do with the grant. And I'm gonna show you what that list is, but we're gonna start with the grant purposes and the things that we absolutely have to do with the grant because it was the intention of the grant. So if you take a look at this list, you're gonna see that the intentions are under infrastructure sustainability, quality access, peer support, and leadership. So I'm gonna to read to you just a list of bulleted items of the things that are required. So the first one is developing and or expanding peer support services, peer leadership, and peer engagement strategies statewide, developing appropriate training, education, resource, collaboration, and tools. This year was actually one of the first years of the SAMHSA grant that they had such a strong focus on the peer workforce, the peer movement, and peer support as a professional discipline. There are certain things that we built into the grant specifically around peer support, but one of the reasons they have shared with us why they have such a focus on peer support is states are at very different levels around peer support. Some states don't have any peer supports, don't have any peer support specialists, other states like ours have a high volume. Some states have very high quality controls in place. Other states don't. Um, but, but what they are recognizing is that coordination of the peer movement and the workforce and opportunities for quality really is best positioned through a peer-run organization that is doing statewide work and looking at the peer service definitions, the peer training, the credentialing, and the quality of services across the state. And so that's why there's been such a big focus this year in the SAMHSA grant on peer support. The second one is increased access to and quality of mental health services. So this is gonna come in a lot of advocacy work around system reform, around quality of life focus and recovery focus around mental health, around advocacy, being involved in, in uh, potential work in Raleigh is really what that one falls under. The third one, which I love that they put in here is increase the sustainability of consumer operated organizations 
we know by being in North Carolina, we have a history of having very few completely consumer operated organizations. And we will talk about the difference between consumer operated, peer staff, so I will get into that in a little bit. But SAMHSA really wants to see the immersion of completely consumer operated organizations around the country. In North Carolina, we have a couple, obviously, you know, Promise Resource Network is the longest standing um, and most funded of all of the consumer run organizations in the state. Um, we have several that are sort of in their beginning stages of, of starting and, and um, evolving. And part of the funding is really to help build uh, sustainability of consumer organizations, build the infrastructure of consumer organizations, and also seek funding for agencies that are completely operated by and for people with lived experience. So I was glad to see that one in there. And then the last one is about capacity. And this one says to enhance state capacity and infrastructure to support the recovery of adults with serious mental illness and co-occurring substance use, including underserved communities. So this is where the other systems work comes in in this grant. This means that there can be a focus on veterans, people who are experiencing chronic homelessness, people who identify or along the sexual orientation continuum, as well as a gender identity continuum, individuals that have been involved in criminal justice and looking at reform efforts um, and, and system change around that, as well as family members. So all of those aspects have got to be a part of this grant and needed to be a part of the proposal. Absolutely. Yeah, there is a big focus on quality, as you can probably see already. There are four required grant activities that we, as a grantee, will absolutely have to undertake as a part of this funding. And we listed them here just so that you can see them and go back um, to the video and, and take a look at these four requirements. The first one is about practices and policies, and that is involvement of people with lived experience around shaping practices and around shaping policies. Um, there are several different bullets that are under that. They include things like raising awareness, having more presence in work groups and in policy discussions, developing alternatives and specific programs, um, and developing leadership among people with lived experience to be involved at the policy and the practice level. The second requirement is a statewide process addressing peer support, and that is the development and an implementation of a statewide process for peer support. So this bullet really includes things like creating standards for peer support specialists, creating standards for their supervisors, creating standards for the providers um, of peer support, the non-peer providers, as well as the providers that do work for consumer-run or peer-run agencies. But that is a required component of this. This includes things like introducing and building up evidence-based practices and the adoption of both evidence-based practices as well as promising practices in peer support as a profession, but also in recovery and recovery-oriented systems of care. It also includes peer training, creating standards for supervision of peer support specialists, and looking at certification um, with, that we have within the state and ways to improve and enhance the certification process. The third requirement is promoting engagement across the state. And so you're gonna see in the way that his, this has been laid, laid out is that we really have to create a unified voice so that people in all different areas of North Carolina have meaningful opportunities to engage in the organization, have opportunities to engage in the peer movement, as well as policy change and practice change. Um, and this is gonna include a variety of different things from building consumer operated agencies having focus groups, town hall meetings, and having other mechanisms for engagement and voice and choice. And then the fourth requirement is the development and implementation of a plan for sustainability. So we actually have to build the sustainability plan now. 
even though it's a three-year grant, we have to be developing uh, funding mechanisms, partnerships, relationships, delivering and demonstrating outcomes as soon as March 31st had rolled around. So we are going to be in the process with everybody that is interested in being a part of this of developing that sustainability plan for when the grant funding ends. While there is financial opportunity at the end of the grant, it is not secured. It is not a given. It is really going to be based on how well we deliver over the next three years. Yeah, so those are required activities. The next slide is the optional or the allowable activities. So they said basically you have to do the things in the required, but you also can build these things into the grant. And this is everything about from building recovery oriented services for people with co-occurring substance use disorders, focusing on integrated care and trauma informed approaches, really focusing on employment and education and criminal justice involvement as well as homelessness. We also can build up organizational development, nonprofit management and leadership of people that identify with lived experience, building and promoting respite care or the peer run um, alternatives to hospitals, peer run respites, looking at financing and business practices so that individual consumer organizations that do start up have some of this knowledge and support and mentorship to be able to be strong and sustain for the long term. And then the last allowable activity is that we can partner with statewide children and youth um, and family serving organizations that are in North Carolina around shared vision and shared, mi shared mission. It was an interesting process. I've never written a federal grant. Lynn is laughing at me because I say interesting in air quotes. Um, there were a lot of eligibility requirements, a lot of rule out standards under this grant that I was not expecting. The first one, and this is really important to note, is that in order to be eligible, you had to be a freestanding mental health consumer operated agency. That means a few things. Number one, you can't have a parent company or be under the umbrella of another organization, um, another organization of a behavioral health provider or another consumer organization. You had to be completely standalone. Number two is when they talk about consumer run agency, they are not talking about employing people with lived experience to provide the services. They're talking about agencies that are independent of the behavioral health system that are operated for and by people with mental health and co-occurring substance use disorders. That means that our board has to be at least 51% of people with lived experiences. That doesn't include family members. That's 51% of people who are directly impacted by mental health or co-occurring substance use disorders. So some people made the recommendations, well, this agency hires a lot of peers, or this is a peer-run program. SAMHSA really distinguishes between a peer-run program that is operated by behavioral health agencies or advocacy organizations and a consumer-operated organization where the decision-making and the leadership and the influence is by people with lived experience or lived experience. That meant that when we look in North Carolina, the number of organizations that would have been eligible just on this criteria really lessened and decreased down to only a, a handful, maybe a couple of agencies. The second criteria is you had to be operating for at least two years. And that is not just operational on paper, meaning that you had to have your 501c3, but you actually have to have two years of demonstrated experience with outcomes, working with people, doing trainings, managing the fiscal and the business requirements of the agency. So it could not have been somebody who two years ago applied for the 501c3, haven't really been active, but on paper there were two years. They really looked at the history and um, the demonstrated experience of the organization. If you didn't have that, you would not be eligible to have applied. The third one is what I just said, that you have to have the infrastructure. They look at all of your funding mechanisms, your business mechanisms, and make sure that everything is operating well, um, that it is on the up and up or, or uh, legitimate, um, and that you can manage everything that goes along with the SAMHSA grant because the requirements 
are unbelievable for reporting and documenting and demonstrating outcomes. Uh, I was not prepared for all of the requirements that there are. And then there is not more than one statewide consumer peer agency that is recognized by SAMHSA and funded by SAMHSA in any given state. And so one of the things that I'm hearing from people is there was a, a confusion about what a statewide organization is. And if I have an agency in a local community and then I provide services in other parts of the state, am I the statewide organization or can I be the statewide organization? That's not how this works. So with a SAMHSA grant for the statewide consumer organization, you are designated and recognized by the federal government as the statewide organization in that state, and they only allow one and seed and fund one. And so this is that one organization in North Carolina. The application process, the review process, the selection process was something that I have never experienced in my life. Just to be able to apply, there were probably about five to six steps. So we had a two month window to apply. Of those two months, six weeks was just trying to figure out if we can apply. And it takes that long to even figure out eligibility, which left us with a few weeks to actually write the grant. The grant itself, our application, ended up being well over 100 pages with a whole bunch of appendices. It was quite um, the uh, document that we submitted, and there are several things that we had to submit with it and demonstrate experience. Once it's submitted, it has to be accepted by the system. That's a whole other process just to be in the system and to be accepted. Once it was accepted, we probably went through I would say at least four or five different layers of review in order um, before we are awarded. So these are not handed out lightly. There are a lot of factors that go into making these decisions. And it was by far the most intense process that I have ever experienced in, in doing this before. Um, so I'm glad I was a Just little bit naive. Yeah. yeah, it was it was really quite remarkable. But the good thing is once you have a SAMHSA grant and once you have this recognition and this funding, you are in the system which creates opportunities for additional um, funding that wouldn't have otherwise been there. So it really does position us well in North Carolina as a consumer and peer movement. I'm glad we ended up doing it. But if you had talked to me the week before, I would have said, I'm not doing this thing. It's too much. So given that, I want to pause and see if you have any questions. Because the audio is not working, um, Lynn is taking a look at the Q&A and the chat boxes, things like that. Um, but I do want to pause and see if there are any questions that you want to add to the Q&A so we can answer out loud. So Lynn is answering Cindy's question right now. We will post this on PRN's website as well as on the Facebook page. All of the updates that we do for this and opportunities to be involved in Pure Voice NC are going to be on our Facebook page. And you will see in the PowerPoint is the link to that Facebook page. Okay, I'm going to let Lynn continue to answer questions and I'm going to continue with the presentation. So I really wanted to give kudos to North Carolina because we were one of only, I think it was seven states that were awarded this grant. Um, you'll see Alaska, Massachusetts, New Jersey, California, Maryland, Missouri, and us in North Carolina. Part of the SAMHSA's consideration about who gets the grant is your state and what is going on in your state to create opportunities to make this seed really plant and grow. North Carolina truly is primed right now with all of the right ingredients to build and mobilize a community of peers and consumers. And we actually had to justify that in the grant with a lot of data and information coming out of North Carolina. I tried to summarize that in this one, one slide. 
number one, we are going through this process of seeking Medicaid expansion, whether it's going to be approved, we're not really sure what's going to happen with Medicaid expansion. That was the meeting at the governor's mansion yesterday, and there is definitely um, a desire to uh, have Medicaid expanded into North Carolina. That would cover an additional 144,000 people in the state of, of North Carolina for Medicaid. But that one issue, the fact that we're looking at that, um, is an ingredient that makes North Carolina ripe for involvement of, of consumers in voice, specifically around policy and practice change. The second is we're going through a reform effort. And so the next two are really a focus of those reform effort. So as you all probably know, the state, the Secretary of the State, Mandy Cohen, is looking at the modification of our uh, Medicaid system uh, and state funded system to be integrated with behavioral health and physical health. That creates a lot of opportunities for us to talk about our experience um, with integrated care and how that could potentially work on the ground. Along with that is the focus of social determinants of health and prioritizing not only the emotional wellness of people and the physical health, but all of the other things that we have known impact wellness, things like poverty and homelessness, former incarceration, lack of equity and parity. And so that is being written into our reform efforts right now. There is also a bill that um, has been presented and supported. It did make it into the funding. It's House Bill 983, and it's a pilot for Peer Wellness Center. We absolutely urge everybody with lived experience to go read that bill and support it. That would allow a couple of pilots of what we have here in, at PRN, our, our recovery hub, um, and what they have at Green Tree and a couple of other organizations in North Carolina, that would allow us to demonstrate that peer-run wellness centers support health and healing and recovery and can be significant, particularly, particularly around social determinants of health and integrated care. We also found some data and we uh, learned that 70% of people in North Carolina that do receive Medicaid benefits have either a mental health or a mental health co-occurring substance use disorder label. So we have a very high volume of people with lived experience in our state. And of course, as you all know, we have over 3,300 North Carolina peer support specialists. We have talked to states that have had three, five, 10. We've talked to states that have had none. We have a very high volume, which also means that a unified standard of peer support as a professional discipline and quality that is consistent becomes really vital with a, a mass number like 3,300. Absolutely. Um, and adding to those ingredients is something that we don't have. We have all of those things and no statewide movements and no statewide organization that truly is united and working together. And so when SAMHSA looked at this in North Carolina, um, what they concluded was we have a significant gap and a significant need right now for the voice and leadership of people with lived mental health experience. And we have an opportunity in North Carolina to really build peer run organizations and create niche alternatives to traditional treatments in North Carolina. All of that made us ripe for this grant. On the other hand, we've been hearing all over North Carolina from peer supporters, peer support workers, from providers, a list of challenges and barriers that we are experiencing, particularly by peer support specialists. We made a list of them from co-optation and marginalization and exploitation that peer support specialists are experiencing within the organizations that they are being hired, um, to being hired and supervised by people that are really trying to supervise them with a clinical vantage point and scope because they are not familiar with the practice of peer support, that they're being hired in agencies that are not prepared to integrate peers into the work workforce, that there is a lack of supervision opportunities that are based on the scope of practice specifically for peer support, and Peers are frequently having to go to continuing education that are provided through a clinical lens um, because other than RAP and maybe one or two other training opportunities, 
all the continuing education in North Carolina is done through the clinic, clinical vantage point, not through the peer worker vantage point or peer support specialist scope of practice. We're hearing great inconsistencies around quality of peer training. Uh, we have a lot of trainers, we have a lot of curricula. Um, and so whenever you have a system that is that large, obviously there is room for improvement and, and needing of um, changes. Um, we continually hear that there is a desire to have a licensure in North Carolina for peer support specialists um, that goes beyond the current certification process and that we need to be able to have a voice at, at the system level that is not based on being shoulder tapped on advisory groups and committees that are run by the state, run by MCOs, or run by the provider community. That we, as a community of people with lived experience, have got to lead the system, not continuously being in the position of responding to it. And there can be experiences of tokenism where certain people are shoulder tapped for these opportunities um, that others are not. There's also a need for independent peer-run organizations to actually provide peer support. And right now, that funding stream doesn't exist in North Carolina, um, as all of the funding goes to behavioral health agencies to hire peers. And of course, as we said in the previous slide, we need innovative peer-run alternatives to traditional treatments, particularly as we're looking at people that have experienced poverty and homelessness, incarceration, people that identify on the sexual identity and gender identity spectrum, there is alternatives to traditional treatments that we need, that we know that people with lived experience are really poised to engage people differently. So those are some of the ingredients that led SAMHSA to make a decision about North Carolina. We're gonna talk just briefly about why PRN. So they chose North Carolina for very specific reasons, but they also chose uh, PRN for specific reasons. And we just wanna point it out uh, a couple of different things. The third one is Promise Resource Network has been here for 15 years in uh, Mecklenburg County. We are completely consumer run. Our staff comes from the same backgrounds as the people that um, we're providing supports to. And all of our programs, we have seven initiatives, are uh, peer run and peer staff. Our goal is really threefold our mission. The first one is to really elevate the experiences and the voices of lived experience. And we look at all different types of lived experience in addition to mental health and substance use. So you will see that we do a lot of work on the forensic side. We do a lot of work on the housing and the homelessness side. We do work with foster care systems and court systems because we are not as human beings just siloed into one system or another. We are impacted by many of them. It's mental health. Work through it. Absolutely. The second one is that we are committed to authentic peer support and effective peer support. We believe very strongly in the power of genuine peer support when it is done well and when it is done through the values, the guiding principles, and using the tools that we are intended to have in our hands. And so we have pushed for peer support. We were actually the first agency to provide peer support in the state of North Carolina in 2005. And the third part that we do is social change and system transformation. So we do a lot of work around equity um, of people who are experiencing oppression and marginalization based on their lived experience. We do operate seven different recovery and peer initiatives in um, our local uh, community of Mecklenburg County. I'm not gonna go through them. You have the list here. We serve about a thousand people a month who are uninsured and are impacted by numerous different systems and life experiences. And we integrate peer support into various um, systems and programs. Um, so we are not a small agency and we've been doing this for a long time. And that I think added to our credibility in the eyes of SAMHSA. We also had to highlight all of the things that we've been involved with since our inception. Here is a list, I'll just go through a couple of them. As I said, we were the first agency to provide peer support, bringing peer support into North Carolina in 2005. The same year, we started something called Recovery University, which was a recovery immersion training for providers um, to learn about recovery evidence-based practices and promising practices. We started our peer training in 2006, so we've been doing training for peer support specialists and providers 
for many years in North Carolina. And you'll see in 2006 is where we started our Peer Wellness Center. We started our Peer Run uh, Warm Line in that year. We piloted supported employment using an employment peer mentor. We we're the first ones in the state to bring IPS into North Carolina. And that led uh, in 2014 when the DOJ settlement occurred for us to start the first technical assistance center in North Carolina for supported employment and integrating employment peer mentors into that model. Absolutely, and we worked really hard to get that as a part of the model in North Carolina. Lynn and I spent countless hours developing the model, the curricula, piloting it. She is still training employment peer mentors. And so that is definitely something for North Carolina uh, MPRN to be, to be proud of. And then you'll start to see things like we started a transition aged youth um, initiative, a peer initiative in 2016. And that's when we started our housing, our reentry, our uh, core involvement, um, peer support programs. And that led to 2018 and 2019 of uh, being recognized around the country as one of the best small nonprofits in the country the only agency in North Carolina. So we were very proud of that. Okay, enough about us. Let's talk about Peer Voice NC. So when we developed the proposal, we coined it Peer Voice NC just because we came to the end of the proposal and said, oh no, what are we gonna call this? And Lynn and I played around and played around and we kept going back to this idea of our individual voices are valued and so is our collective voice but also there's an expertise that comes along with our lived experience. That led us to this idea of voice, which stands for valuing our individual and collective experience and expertise. Our own um, Jen C. Baker and ironically our CFO came up with a logo. Um, so we do have a logo, we do have our colors and it is now known to SAMHSA as Pure Voice NC. What we decide to do with Pure Voice NC as a state is up to us as a state. And when I say us, I don't mean PRN, I mean our collaborative of unified voices. If we look at what other statewide consumer organizations have done, as, as Lynn said, you're gonna see all of these different examples that I have in these bubbles. Everything from elevating peer support to alternative tr to traditional models to incubating peer run agencies, advocating and uh, for system change and policy, training and technical assistance. Um, we do have a part in here of, for this particular grant of starting up a North Carolina Recovery and Peer Technical Assistance Center. And Lynn is gonna share that part with you in a little while. All of this to be said, there are certain things under the SAMHSA grant that we have to do. There are other things that we need to do order to start a strong movement. And that is gonna be developed by our community. We put in this something called collective impact, which means that Shireen and Lynn are not gonna sit down, design it and push it out and say, this is who we are and this is what we're gonna do. This really is about us coming together as a state and designing it as we go along, making sure that we meet the SAMHSA requirements, but we're also say, making some decisions that are specific to North Carolina. Absolutely. And if not, please email us. We will respond, I promise you, or check us out on the Facebook page. So there are two primary goals that SAMHSA is funding for Peer Voice NC to do over the next three years. Underneath these goals, there are multiple objectives. So don't let it fool you. It sounds like it's two goals, but when we start digging in, there's a lot of work to be done. This is actually coming from the proposal and what was approved. So goal number one is really building that grassroots regional connection to incubate and launch this independent organization. And we have until March 22 to do it. 
So this is really the growing and the building of an independent statewide peer-run organization. Under there, there are several objectives. The first objective is that we are going to be looking regionally at existing po peer coalitions. It may end up being based on the current MCO LME regional structure. It might change depending on different regions and where um, the people lie that want to be involved. But minimally, we have to help support existing coalitions and or start other coalitions to have at least seven regional ones around North Carolina to link them, to collaborate um, really on developing an effective peer movement, on policies and practices, on identifying trends that are happening in our state, um, tools that will advance mental health recovery. And this one is really about finding, linking, and mobilizing around system change. Absolutely. So goal number one, the second objective. Of those regional groups, Lynn and I are going to be working with peer leaders from those groups, working with you at least on a quarterly basis to help organize the statewide peer run organization. And there are a lot of different things that we're going to be doing together that you will see as we go along will emerge. But there will be leaders one to two from each of those peer coalitions that we are going to be working with very closely to start up and uh, build this, this coalition and this organization. Yeah, and so you probably, if you've been connected through our Facebook page, the Peer Voice NC Facebook page, if you've been a part of the other Facebook pages that are up, like the NC Canso Facebook page and the North Carolina Certified excuse me, Peer Specialist Facebook page, I've been posting a bunch of questions. One of the questions that I've asked is, are there existing organizations, coalitions, or groups in different regions that are working together? That's why I asked that question, is we need to find out who is working currently and support them. And if they don't exist or they don't want to be a part of it, then we need to build them. The third objective, and this one gives us until September 2019 to develop it and to launch it by, the, by March 20 of 21, is we're developing a two-day peer leadership academy for those peer coalitions. That is going to be a combination of grassroots organizing, how to build allies, identify uh, needs assets. in the community and assets in the community, and how to mobilize around system transformation. So it's gonna be called, I think it's probably gonna be called the Peer Leadership Academy, and it's gonna be two days, uh, with likely with Lynn and I. Yeah. Right. 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 And then the last objective under this is that we're going to sustain a peer run 501c3, that we're going to build it, we're going to coordinate it, and we're going to support the sustainability of this statewide organization. And they're going to give us the 2022. So everything that goes along with that needs to be done from who will be a part of that organization, what is the advisory or board structure, to what is the mission and the vision and the values starting it up, getting the 501c3, securing funding, everything that goes along with starting a, a peer organization um, is a part of this one. And this one's gonna be the statewide agency. So there is the second goal, which I'm gonna ask Lynn to walk you through the second goal. As if, as if we don't have enough to do. Right. We thought we'd add some more. Um, it, so as we think of really how to have our voices impact, we have sort of the grassroots community, the second community that is just as much a part of, of our voice is that community of the working peer supporters. What we know is that we have an, an incredible amount of trainings um, that, that although we support, we work under the same competencies, the way they're delivered, the way they, what they um, highlight and influence are all different. And so we have a very unstandardized 
and in some places co-opted peer, um, peer worker community. So we wanted to support that community as well. So our second goal of this grant is that by March 2022, we will develop and operate an NC Peer and Recovery Technical Assistance Center that will be there for peer workers. It will, this is still seven regionals. Where's mine? Sorry guys. Um, no, this is still part of the PLA. And we need to move forward to my online training. This is my online training. Sorry guys, it's more of the work that we're gonna be doing with the uh, regional networks. No. So what this will be is an online training um, platform similar to Relias, if any of you have ever used that in your work uh, that provides online training that can be uh, used for your continuing ed hours, anything of that sort. We are gonna have two tracks of an online training. Uh, it will be an interactive online training, though not just uh, sitting and, and staring at a screen, but instead we will be providing peer developed, peer led and peer supported trainings to provide the skills, knowledge and competencies that are needed in our work. Even if all of our trainings were perfect, 40 hours of training is totally insufficient to support us to bring the values of peer support into our work and to be able to advocate to make sure our jobs stay peer. This will be that support for the peer workers, the over 3,000 peer workers that we have in the state. So we will be doing that by uh, 2022, uh, including really important topics um, around best practices about psychiatric advanced directives, trauma-informed care, as well as difficult conversations with your colleagues, <coughs> excuse me, with your supervisors and so forth. And speaking of supervisors, the second track, will also be to train the supervisors so that they can better understand the job and what they should be supporting their peer workers to do. As I say, all of this is peer, uh, peer delivered, peer created, and peer run. And so we will have some uh, training modules that we will take from all of our experience, but we will be reaching out to you as well to be part of the trainer or the developing uh, group in the state so that this stays peer run, peer delivered, and peer relevant. So many of our continuing hours that people get are things like um, uh, motivational interviewing presented by a clinician who does it from a very clinical perspective. So how do we really support that 40 hours of training and really help the peer role be and become a stronger peer role when we're in those behavioral health settings where it's so challenging to stay in the role? Um, so that is sort of the second prong of this. Sorry for my confusion initially. Yeah. My <laughs> yeah, I want to go back to that that one just to make sure that we cover that as well. So under the Peer and Recovery Technical Assistance Center, there will be um, a, a work around social media camp campaign to create awareness of issues, social justice issues, provide up-to-date research, resources, information, as well as call to action for things that are related to mental health recovery and peer-related social issues, policy, and practices. So that all goes under the Peer and Recovery Technical Assistance Center. And then the trainings are also part of the Peer and Recovery Te Technical Assistance Center. So I just want to make sure that um, we cover that as well. So those are the goals that we have proposed. We built in several partners that we had talked to and um, worked with on the front end to uh, be a part and ri be written into the grant. The first one is um, Victoria Mosey and Jeff Neer from RDU CPSS Peer Coalition. They are the first peer coalition that will be a part of this and they are in the Raleigh-Durham area. 
Um, they are in the process, they've been developing their strategic plan, growing their peer supporters in their area, and we are going to be working with them to support their efforts and be a part of this initial um, work with SAMHSA. The second partner is Say It Solutions. Karen Crambuel is the owner and the developer of Say It Solutions, which is an online platform to teach self-advocacy and self-determination um, for people with lived experience. It is also an approved continuing education for peer support workers. As a part of this proposal, we will be paying for a certain number of um, people to take the Say It Solutions tra online training. We feel very strongly that if we are not strong self-advocates and we are not self-determined, -determ it can be difficult then to advocate at a broader level on behalf of others. And this really breaks down nicely the skills that are needed for effective advocacy. So we are working with Karen and Say It to make this available to a group of people in North Carolina. The third one is our North Carolina Evidence-Based Practice Center. PRN has been partnering them with a, a very long time for a variety of different projects. Currently, we're partnering with them on the Psychiatric Advanced Directives. They are allowing us to use their technology platform so that we can make the supervisory trainings available throughout North Carolina to the supervisors of the peer support specialists. And so we are gonna be working with them to tap into that platform and make this available throughout North Carolina when we get to the point of launching it. The next partner is Alliance MCO. We also have been working with Alliance for, gosh, many years from everything from recovery and peer support to now psychiatric rehabilitation. They have a very large group of peer support specialists who are certified in their area. When we wrote this grant, it was around 780. They have over 20 peer providers and they are going to work with us to be able to pilot the advanced education and continuing education for the peers, but also the supervisory training for the providers. We're gonna pilot it in that area, perfect it, get it right, before we launch it throughout North Carolina. And we are very appreciative to Alliance for working with us and giving us access to their peer support specialists and their providers um, to work this out in real time and figure out what is usable on the ground for people. And then our last le uh, partner is the Leadership Fellows Academy. Uh, I have some LFA people, I think, on this call right now. And the LFA is going to be supporting through technology and offering some supports to LFA graduates. We will be working likely with the third cohort around grassroots organizing and issues that are impacting people with lived experience. Um, and so the LFA is going to be a strong partner in this project. Um, they've already been a strong partner and our LFA graduates are definitely gonna have a, a role if they choose to be a part of this organizing effort. The key personnel, so right now I'll say, I am the project director that's named on the project and my um, job is really the oversight, kind of, kind of the boring stuff, but, but important stuff. Right now, Lynn is the project coordinator. She's responsible for the day-to-day -day and the deliverables. Sadly, Lynn has only given us up to three months of her time to be able to kick this off. So we will be looking for a project coordinator in a couple of months for um, this initiative. So yeah, we, we're not gonna get, get rid of Lynn completely. She will be involved in it, um, but we are going to be hiring a project coordinator. I'm gonna put that out um, as a job opportunity. Uh, it's a full-time employment opportunity at this point, and we really want to find somebody who is good at organizing and uniting, that has experience with um, uh, grassroots organizing and big system change, that has lived mental health experience, and can really help us to uh, do this work and do it well. And our evaluation consultant is Mark Saltzer, who agreed on the front end to oversee the data analysis and the performance assessment. So we are so grateful to him and, and happy to be working with him on this project. Okay, we're rounding near the end. There's only a couple of things um, that I wanna share with you. I'm not going to go through this. You will see it on your slides, but we did put out year one, year two, and year three the major things that we are gonna have to work on and make sure that we are delivering on over the next few years. So we broke down the big grant into a few major categories, and then we broke it down into the next several months. So the first handful of months, 
you're going to see that we have a lot of things that we need to demonstrate outcomes already. Um, absolutely. If we do not accomplish these things, we uh, could potentially lose funding for year two and year three. Yeah. So we are working very steadily on making sure that we're prepared uh, to take on a project of this magnitude. Um, we just wanted to, to share with you, because I think there was a little bit of confusion about Promise Resource Network and our role. We are not becoming the statewide peer and consumer organization. We are supporting the incubation, the startup, the development, and launching of the statewide organization. Our job is to provide the TA, the technology, the mentoring, the training, the opportunities for national consulting work, um, for you to be... Uh, uh, reached by nat national consultants. Our job is really to put together the framework for these things um, and to help get it up and running. Really, this is going to be designed and built by you, by the community of people that really want to be in on the ground level of a grassroots movement. Um, we are just providing the structure and the support to make it happen and, and make it successful. Where do we go from here? So please, if you haven't done so already, sign on to the Facebook page. All of our updates and opportunities, like that job opportunity that's coming up, opportunities to be a part of advisory groups, questions that we have about finding peer coalitions, all of those things are on the Facebook page. And this is the link um, to that. So please join it. They will ask you, uh, there, there's a brief survey that you start out with. Um, so fill out that sur survey and you'll be connected to the network. Um, also, we are developing an external listserv of people in North Carolina who have been trained as peer specialists, uh, as well as those who become certified as peer support specialists, as well as those who identify with lived experience. We have recognized that um, the listservs that do exist really do exist inside of systems. So um, the UNC Behavioral Health Services has a listserv or the, the contacts of people who become certified, and other MCOs have other listservs. We really want to develop a listserv that is um, outside of systems so that we can connect and mobilize and communicate without any fear um, that I can't say this because this is a part of this group or this is a part of my agency or this is a part of, of a government entity. Um, it's important for us to have links to each other that can really be authentically communicating. UNC um, also um, graciously has agreed to put this information out to the folks that have become certified with the recognition that this is not a part of what they're doing, but if they want to become a part of the state movement and the state organization, if they want to fill out the survey that they can. Um, so if Tara, if you're on, thank you very much for your willingness to do that. And Bernice as well. And Bernice, uh, if you're on as well, yep, actually I see Bernice's name. So if you want to fill out the survey, please link and fill it out um, and then join the Facebook. We are going to be seeking that project coordinator in a few months. Um, we are actively seeking both inside North Carolina as well as people who are, who are well known or connected nationally for that position. So if you know somebody, maybe yourself would be a great candidate, please let us know. And we are trying to find the existing coalitions. So if you know of any that are, that are operated by people with lived experience throughout the regions with a focus on mental health, um, please let us know who these groups are and how we can uh, connect with them to partner. Yeah, please. Versus addictions, in some ways, you know, Really hard to try to be a unified community, yeah. um, but I think in some ways, as we've done that, sort of the individual unique pieces of each community get lost in that, and so we just want to acknowledge that this is um, sort of reconnecting more on the mental health side, and for people that have mental health, not as an exclusionary that we, no. you know, we, we don't want to play in the same sandbox. Um, but that it is important that both systems get the attention that they need at different times. And this, this really is going to be about the attention on the mental health side of our system. 
which also is segregated, you know, from the um, substance use side of government. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not all allies. So we ask all allies to also, um, you know, join in if you um, would so like, because we would love to have you there. But when we do the reach out for peer run organizations, there again, we are talking about ones that are with the focus on mental health, not a, a predominantly um, substance use peer run agency, um, just because it's the nature of the beast. So. Right, and mental health. Yes, we recognize that so many of us um, have experienced both, uh, right. including Lynn, who, I, who identifies and has been involved in both systems for years. So this is not at the exclusion of, mental, right. of substance use. This is a, uh, the inclusion of people that have been affected by both of those systems, both of those services, and both of those labels. We are also seeking leadership. So please, you probably have seen me reach out, talking to a lot of people, meeting with a lot of people. In order for this to work, we need strong leadership from within our, our community. And so we need to know who you are. Please let us connect with you and just have conversations and get to know um, one another because that's the only thing that is going to make something like this work. It's got to be done grassroots um, and we have to grow the movement to develop the organization and have it sustained. We are looking for feedback and recommendations. Um, you will see that I posted some things on Facebook about what are training topics? What are standards that you would like to see and challenges that you're experiencing? What are social justice issues um, that your community is facing? So please log on to Facebook to contribute to that conversation. And don't forget to support the uh, bill that is currently presented, Bill 983 for Peer Wellness Center Pilot. We feel very strongly that peer run um, opportunities and alternatives are what is going to be needed uh, to reach people in really different, engaging ways. And the first one of those came out of Georgia, thanks to the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Organization. So just saying. Yeah. So we have an opportunity to be on the in the ground floor with that yeah. in North Carolina. We did leave you with a couple of resources so you can go back. We know there's a lot of information to absorb. The first one is a, a statewide repository of other statewide consumer and peer organizations that you can link onto. Then you can go onto their um, social media and their websites to find out all of the good work that statewide organizations do. And the last two are really about organizing. How do we bring people together to organize and create these statewide impactful movements? Um, and so I wanted to make sure you had those so you can take a look and, and we can learn from things that have been done well mm -hmm. in the past. We don't need to reinvent that wheel. Um, so thank you so much. We appreciate you being a part of this very much. These are our email addresses. So if you have questions, please feel free to email. Um, but we also want to pause here and see if you have questions that you want to put into the box. Sometimes there's a little glitch here. Okay, and we're just going to pause for a minute and see if there are any questions through the Q&A box or through the chat box that you have. Oh, I hear somebody in the background. Barbara, is that you? Hey, can you hear me? Oh, it's me. Disguised as Barbara and my chat name, but it's but I'm BB. Oh, BB. Hello, Hello. BB. And I'm happy to uh, see this getting started and happy to be an ally. 
That's all I'm going to say. Oh, thank you, BB. You've been a wonderful partner, and so is the North Carolina Evidence-Based Practice Center. So we're so appreciative of these relationships. Yeah, I'm really excited to see this. Anyways, uh, we're grateful for your help. BJ, I'm sure we'll be uh, talking to you soon about that. Thank you. Hi, BJ. Okay, any other questions or comments that anybody wants to make? I can't get it to work. Oh, well. Oh, BJ hey, saying she can't. Oh, BJ, I heard you. Oh, okay, cool. There you are. Yay. I love it when a plan comes together. Hi, BJ. Okay. Yeah, I'm willing to jump on board with you guys. That's for sure. I know this is needed desperately for people to get treated appropriately for being peer supports and really be recognized that we can help other other people to find recovery. There's no reason for us not to. And I love this. Thank you both so much and everyone that's contributed for your work. This is incredible. Yeah. Thank you, BJ. So now that we know how to unmute people, are there any other questions that people have? Aha. We're learning as we go. Okay. And Nate, if you have direct links to existing groups, um, veterans groups that um, are, are operated by veterans that experience emotional health issues, please let us know because we definitely want to, to link in and provide supports um, if we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, the, the veterans. They Absolutely. Okay, let me do one more scan, see if anybody else, uh, their hands are up or there's anything else in our chat room. Oh, Jacob, Jacob, let me see if I can unmute you. Jacob, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Ah, you're there. Beautiful. So um, I was just wondering in terms of expressing interest in, in participation in all this, uh, where is there a way to specify? I'm, I, don't, I think I signed up for the listserv. I'll, I'll have to double check. Um, but to specify which areas of, of this project I think I could be useful in. Yeah, so we, my experience is with is primarily with ACT. So when it comes to, you know, integrating with ACT and IPS and facility based crisis and, and the other areas that peers work within uh, more traditional services, I feel like I could be really helpful in terms of like peer run organizations, that's not something I have a lot of experience with. Is there a, a place on that form to sort of outline that? We're not there yet, Jake. What we want to do is really sort of let you guys know what this is. Um, to kick it off today, in these next couple of weeks, as we sort of break down all of our next steps, part of it is really to pull out, put out calls for different areas to the community in a more 
that's a fine way. Right now, it's just some sort of, if you're interested in wanting to be a part of sign up and we'll give you a birthday, we're going to be you know, making that more specified over time yeah. as we start to develop the education in the um, regional areas. Each of those will have subsets of out calls to folks. And if you guys are interested in the specific things, you can also just post that on the Facebook or in an email to either myself or someone. Now I am Jacob. I'm keeping track of all of the responses that I get in Facebook, um, whether it's our site or other sites. When people are making recommendations or they're asking to be a part of this, um, I'm I look at it every single day, multiple times a day. Can I ask what area you're in? Uh, I live in Orange County. I work right now. I'm working in Wake County, but uh, okay. nine years previous. Let's see, I did nine years on an ACT team in Durham, and then before that I did two years facility-based crisis in Chapel Hill. Okay, good. So that's yeah. good to know that you're out in that region. That region actually is becoming the first one that we are working with. And so yeah, the already you just post in here with me. Oh, good, okay, <laughs> perfect. Because I think you're, geographically, you're also in a very good physical space around getting involved with this in the beginning, just because we're gonna be working with Victoria and Jeff and, and that whole group. So that is definitely a group um, that you want to connect with and see how to be a part of, uh, because we are gonna be kicking it out, kicking it off with that network. So the, the only issue there is that they meet on Saturdays and that's why I haven't been involved with them historically is uh, I try really hard not to work on Saturdays since yeah. the Sabbath. Uh, so I'll, I'll get up with Jeff about other ways to connect with his group. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and I believe they, they meet on Saturdays, but part of this is going to be looking at um, work that is going to be do, being done around the community and in the community in different ways to connect with people and grow the network. Um, mm -hmm. So I think uh, there might be some additional ways to be a part of it um, that may not be coming to that meeting on Saturdays, but definitely talk with, talk with Victoria and Jeff and connect with us um, because, you know, that's, it's a good way to get started with this. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. You know, do the next steps forward. So you will be hearing a lot more from us now that I'll put it back in the cloud. But we would be so excited to get this piece of this piece done and be able to introduce it. Is what's required and why that also ties away within those requirements. You know? Wonderful. So, if there are no other questions or comments, um, I will be posting this link. Actually, probably Gen Z will be posting this link <laughs> on our Facebook page, and we will be sharing it on other Facebook pages so people can go back and review this and look at the slides and print out the slides. So, oh, hold on. Looks like we might have another question. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you all so very much. Um, I appreciate you all and I cannot wait to see where we go with this in North Carolina. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you.